Welcome back, everybody. Our next guest is a biracial woman who was adopted by a white family in New Hampshire. And in her childhood, she didn't see her first other black person until the age of six. In her memoir entitled Surviving the White Gaze, she talks about the long and difficult journey in finding her blackness. Joining us now is author and podcast host Rebecca Carroll to share her fascinating story. Welcome to the show, Rebecca. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's great to meet you, Rebecca. Um, let's get right in um, and start with the title of your book. You said that it was Toni Morrison who introduced you to the expression uh, white gaze, but in, in the context of your life experiences, what you've been through, what, how would you define white gaze? So Toni Morrison, of course, has been my North Star uh, uh, throughout my adult life. But when, when I first heard her say it, I was working as a producer for the um, now defunct um, Charlie Rose show here in, in New York. And she was a guest on the show. And I heard her talking about this thing, the white gaze. And I remember sort of feeling kind of tingly, like, wow, that's what it is. This hmm. feeling that I've been trying to get out from under right, which is that it's the default, it's the default standard, the default tenor, tone, structure that, that decides what is valuable across industry, the canon of literature, the standard of beauty, uh, what, what education means, uh, what should be taught, what history looks like. It is all a default under the white gaze. Hmm. So you, uh, as I said off the top, you were adopted by a white family. And uh, as a result of that, you've been fairly outspoken on transracial adoption. And you've said that, you know, you think it is a necessary consideration that white families be prepared, better prepared um, in adopting black children um, in order to be able to really value uh, the child's blackness. So given all of that you've, you've spoken about, how do you think your family did? It's not a matter of how they did. It's sort of how they didn't, right? Um, which mm. is that they were extremely loving um, and, you know, sort of unconventional and had, you know, these wonderful artistic, they, as artists, they had imagination and we lived in this beautiful, idyllic, um, bucolic world. And it was all, it, it was beautiful. That's why I opened the book with that chapter, which is essentially the white gaze, mm -hmm. um, this bubble right, that was sort of curated by my parents, um, in which I fit in a kind of, um, you know, as a, as, a, as a beautiful young black girl who was curious and outgoing and precocious and loved fashion. Um, and then when we moved from this house on the hill, where, where we were surrounded by, you know, gardens and um, beauty and um, flowers, you know, we moved and within a year or two, my fifth grade teacher told me I was very pretty for a black girl. And so began this sort of avalanche of, of mm. experiences of racism that I had absolutely no tools to uh, manage or confront. And my parents, mm. like it didn't even occur to me to discuss it with them because it had never come up. You know, and mm -hmm. and so, in terms of of how they did and how I believe white parents of black children should be prepared, if you are not thinking about your child's blackness, if you are saying to that child, the only way in which I will value you is if I don't see your, if I strip you of something that is so integral to who you are, then you're not parenting your black child. Well, I want to stay with that um, as as we talk about your biological mother, uh, Tess, mm. and and the 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 reader gets the sense that you you wanted approval, um, or at least um, you wanted to establish some sort of positive connection, but you also say that she constantly erased your blackness. She even dictated what was and wasn't black. Um, can you talk about how her rejection shaped uh, your life, affected you? I was 11 years old when my, when my adoptive parents gave me the power to choose whether or not it was mm. the appropriate time to meet my birth mother. That's the first thing, right? So at 11 years old, after having fantasized about this woman, 
uh, and meeting her, of course, having been given away by her and seeing that this strong, beautiful figure who was funny and charismatic and bright, you know, in her 20s. And I just, I, I, I had this combination of, you know, sort of dealing with the, with the internalized abandonment, wanting to please mm -hmm. her, being a yeah. very outgoing child and thinking that that it wouldn't be so hard to get her to be proud of me i could mm -hmm. dance i could talk i could you know like i but but whatever yeah. it was that i did particularly regarding race was never was never enough for her so it was it was you know it was that whole thing of of kids wanting to please their parents but i was trying to please a parent who had given me up for adoption and and who was now saying to me you're none of the things you think you are well, listen, so much of um, your book's nar narrative uh, came from journals that you kept. And yeah. we get a firsthand, uh, close look at, for example, um, the experience that you shared just a moment ago with a teacher saying that you're very pretty for a Black girl. In your journals and what you write about in this book again, um, it was slave day at school and you were... Yeah bought by a white student. I, I mean, just saying it is very difficult. I can't imagine living it. So what was it like to revisit those journal entries now? It was actually pretty great. I'll say that um, in that I, I think back sometimes on my younger self and I think, good for you. Like you really mm. figured out, first of all, that you're gonna need to chronicle this. And you're also going to need to use these journals and this writing as an opportunity to not just chronicle it, but to work through it. That's a good way to lead us to the next part of our discussion. We do see that you eventually started building relationships and connections with Black people, professors, friends, Black men and women. But some of these relationships, particularly with men, were increasingly complicated. And, and so in turn, you, you, you experienced excessive drinking and unhealthy eating patterns, thoughts of self-harm. Now, we do know how you got to that dark place, but let's talk about how you got out of it. That's that's a, a a great question. I don't feel like I have been asked that, and I love being asked a question I've not been asked. Um, getting Let's out of it, I think producer. it was really. Um, uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> I think coming out of it was um, was about realizing I didn't want to go out like that. Mm. Realizing I didn't want to give myself over somebody else's dictation of what made yeah. me feel really and you know and that came you know there was that that um the scene you know in the book where 9 11 happened and you know i'm on the phone with my mother and then we lose contact and i just it was this moment uh, i mean everything of course was so it was this epic travesty that was all around us and i just had this moment and it actually gives me goosebumps thinking about it now which is just you know who and how and and what am i going to be and what do i need and you know not looking to other people to give it to me um and as families grow and things evolve and change um in the epilogue you talk about how much your adoptive family loved your son kofi um, but that it started to change the more that he began to embrace um, his own blackness. W what was that like mm -hmm. for you? Wild, actually. <laughs> um, and not mm -hmm. least of all, because my son is so self-aware, um, you know, like that he had a sense of, of who he was in that context. And when I was his age, you know, at, at various points, I had no idea, right, like how to... Mm -hmm. Um, how to notice that there were really no white, no other black folks around or that there weren't any black, there wasn't any black art on our walls or books on our bookshelves or, you know, like, and he's very, very keen to all of that. Um, but yeah, it was, it was, it was heartening in the, in the way that I was proud of my child and my son, disheartening in that there was this continuation of sort of either not seeing my blackness or his blackness, or just not knowing how to embrace and or interact with it.
Rebecca, we so appreciate you being here today. Um, and I know, as we've just learned, it was hard, but at the same time, our viewers and readers are better for it that you've shared your story. Thank you so much for being here. Rebecca's book, Surviving the White Gaze, is available now, and we'll be right back.